Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's great to have so many folks on the webinar today. I think some people are still joining us from the waiting room. So we'll kind of take it slowly here for a couple of minutes to make sure everyone gets on. Um, but for those of you who may be new to these calls and, and don't know me, I'm Emily Beauregard. I'm the director of Kentucky Voices for Health and I'm a member of the Thrive Kentucky campaign. I hope everyone joining us today fared okay during Friday's storms um, and that your week has started off with electricity and Wi-Fi. If not in your own home, um, then at another warm and safe location. Um, but our hearts are with the families who lost a loved one and everyone who's dealing with storm damage today. I know it's a lot of people who are you know, dealing with missing parts of their houses, tree damage, and uh, I imagine it's going to be a long recovery for some. And Good reminder for us um, about why having our legislators invest in disaster recovery can't wait and especially for housing. So I'm sure we'll talk more about that later. But of course, we are also well over halfway through the legislative session now. Um, simultaneously, we're preparing for the end of the federal public health emergency and for resuming Medicaid renewals. So we have a lot of updates for you today, like always. Um, and why don't we advance the slide, Kelly? I know that most of you are familiar with Thrive Kentucky now and the work that we do, but for those of you who are joining us again for the first time, um, our mission is to meet the basic needs of every Kentuckian through systemic change. Because we recognize that many of our fellow Kentuckians have faced historical and systemic barriers to meeting their basic needs. You can see the um, guiding principles that that really guide our work that we, we do together in, in terms of policy advocacy. And if we go to the next slide, these are our steering committee members. And if you wanna learn any, anything about um, our individual organizations, you can click on those links. We can go to the next slide. Um, always wanna thank our sponsors for supporting this work. Um, it helps us to provide these webinars for free. And it also helps us to provide CEUs for um, community health workers and for licensed social workers. And uh, we're even now putting on a road show every year. We did it last year, we're doing it again this year. So we continue to expand our work. Uh, the support that we get from our sponsors helps us to do that. And uh, if you are interested in sponsoring and you just haven't gotten around to it yet this year, um, one, any of our former sponsors from um, last year will be reaching out to. If you're an organization that's interested in sponsoring for the first time, you can email Kelly Talby or um, me and we'll get you um, all the information that you need. So here's the agenda that we'll be covering today. Um, we really want these webinars to be an opportunity for you to get the latest information on the state and federal landscape, to hear updates about safety net programs, to share feedback with us and to ask questions. Um, so during each of these sections, we found that, you know, we don't do a Q&A at the end of each. So just put um, questions or comments in the chat. We try to get to those as we go. And if we end up with more questions and we can answer in the next 90 minutes, we'll be sure to follow up with answers. Um, so don't let this, the clock stop you from asking your questions. Um, and before we begin, just some quick housekeeping. We do have a lot of folks on the webinar today. So please be sure to mute your line. Um, we are recording this webinar and we'll be sending out the recording along with the slide deck and other materials and an evaluation and a follow-up email. So watch for that tomorrow. And if you are a certified community health worker or a licensed social worker and you'd like to re receive CEUs for attending today's webinar, um, you can email Kelly and she'll put her email address in the chat. Um, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Sheila Schuster, if she's with us yet. And if yes, not, I'm, we can. I'm, I'm here. Oh, you made it, great. Yes. Thank you very much, Emily. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Sheila Schuster, licensed psychologist and executive director of the Advocacy Action Network, which is uh, the Kentucky Mental Health Coalition and the 874K Disabilities Coalition. So we are two thirds of the way through this short session. This is a 30 day session and um, we are uh, looking for more action on bills. In fact, there will be intense action uh, from March 7th through March 16th. Um, if you look at the legislative calendar, March 15th and 16th are marked for what they call concurrence. 
It's what I call the Mother May I days. It's where the House and the Senate have passed two different versions of the same bill. And so then the House and the Senate kind of go back and forth in a kind of a chicken scenario about who's going to back down and who's going to um, take back their changes or agree to the changes made in the other chamber. And typically they don't do that. And so they go into um, what they call a, a, a conference committee uh, behind closed doors. It's a very anxiety producing time for advocates and lobbyists. And they try to reconcile the differences between those two versions. And they come out with a um, recommendation that then has to be adopted by the House and the Senate. And typically they come up with something that is agreeable. Every once in a while, I think in my 40 years up there, I had one bill that they so mangled in that conference committee that we just said goodbye to it and started all over the next session. So um, you get a break from March 17th, St. Patrick's Day through March 28th, where there will be no session. And that's when um, Governor Bashir has those 10 days, including Saturday, but not Sunday, to decide what he wants to do with all of these bills that he'll have on his desk. So he can sign the bill, he could let them become law without his signature, which is kind of his way of saying, I really am not crazy about this piece of legislation, but I don't feel strongly enough that I'm going to veto it, or they can, or he can veto the bills. Um, the legislature then comes back for two more days on March 29th and 30th, and they consider overriding the vetoes. And that's a fairly easy, uh, low bar in Kentucky because it simply takes a simple majority. So um, 20 votes in the Senate and uh, 51 votes in the House. They also may pass additional bills. They do that occasionally. Um, and if they do that, then the governor has free reign. Uh, if he vetoes those bills that are passed on the 29th or 30th, they don't have an opportunity to come back and override those vetoes. Um, by constitution, the last day of the short session is midnight on Thursday, March 30th. Before we had computers, they would sometimes literally stop the hands of the clock from striking midnight, but they can't do that anymore. So it will really end at midnight on um, March 30th. Uh, we have a new senator, Senator uh, Cassie Armstrong from Louisville. She was elected in a special election on February 21st to fill the vacant seat of uh, the Kentucky Senator, now Congressman Morgan McGarvey. And she's been appointed to serve on uh, agriculture, health services, and natural resources and energy uh, committees. Next, please. So what's passed so far? We've had 880 bills that have been filed for consideration, and that doesn't count uh, simple resolutions and joint resolutions and concurrent resolutions, only three have passed and have been signed by the governor so far. House Bill 1, which is a, a budget bill to reduce the state income tax by an additional one half percent. And many of us are extremely concerned about that happening because of the huge hole that it's gonna shoot through our budget uh, in the upcoming years. They also passed a funding bill. They put $16.6 .6 million um, uh, to support the uh, completion, I guess it is, of the Bowling Green Veterans Center, which I believe is a nursing home and other affiliated services. And then there was a workers' comp bill that changed the way the employer organizations registered. So those are the only three that have gone all the way. Um, here's your score scorecard. There have been 67 bills that the House has passed and has sent them over to the Senate for committee action and a floor vote, while the Senate has passed 62 bills and sent them to the House. Last week, um, the House did not take up any Senate bills and the Senate did not take up any House bills. And those of you who have been watching the legislature for a while know that this is kind of the, <laughs> again, the kind of chicken part where the one chamber says, well, we're not gonna take up your bills until you take up our bills and they kind of go back and forth. They cannot do that too long because we only have about two and a half weeks left in the session. So uh, if you look at the calendar coming up for this week, there's no session today, but they will meet Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. There are a number of Senate bills that are being heard in House committees and a number of House bills being heard in Senate committees. 
The remaining days of the session, we'll see um, specially called committee meetings. There was one on Thursday uh, where the Judiciary Committee had met at its regular time on Wednesday, and then they called a special meeting to hear a terrible bill that will talk about House Bill 470. Um, they will sometimes meet upon adjournment, which means after the Senate or the House that day finishes their business. So it could be at 3 or 3.30, or it could be at 4 or 4.30 or 5. I have been in some specially called committee meetings like that that didn't start until 6 o'clock or 6.30, which makes it very, very difficult for people who want to come to Frankfurt and have their, um, their voice heard. And uh, then they do some shenanigans like attaching one bill to another, even though that's called piggybacking and it's not supposed to happen. Or sometimes they'll gut a bill and put in an entirely other bill into its contents. So this is a difficult time for advocates. We really want you to stay tuned. We will do our best, whether you're following Advocacy Action Network or you're following uh, KVH or um, Kentucky Policy or um, KEJC, whatever, whatever group you're with, um, it's a really hard time to give people much notice that a bill is going to be heard and that you need to act. So we ask for you to stay tuned. And I think Marcy later on is going to talk about uh, handling the stresses because this is an extremely stressful time of the uh, session. Next, please. So here are some of our priority areas and some bills that are out there. Um, some of which are moving and some of which may not be, but generally in the health and mental health area, um, bills on certificate of need, um, which is the process uh, to try to regulate how, mon how many health services are in what part of the state. Um, we have some on different facility licensure. We have a bill, House Bill 54, to get Medicaid uh, reimbursement for certified professional midwives. Uh, those are midwives that uh, achieved licensure about four years ago, and they would like to be Medicaid eligible providers. We have some on chronic pain treatments, on uh, coverage uh, in KCHIP for EpiPens. Um, we have two what, what we call companion bills on birthing centers, that's Senate Bill 67 and House Bill 129. We have zero, zero birthing centers in this state. We're one of, uh, I think, only six or seven states that have no birthing centers. So this is um, uh, legislation coming from both the Senate and the House to try to establish these birthing centers. Um, a lot, a lot of moms would like to have that choice. If you don't want to go to a hospital to have your baby, you really don't have much choice uh, except to have the baby at, at home. Um, and we know that uh, Kentucky moms are going over to Southern Indiana. They're going down to Tennessee, the birthing centers there. Uh, House Bill 196 is a bill that just passed uh, the House Committee on Thursday. This is an app that would be free and would go on the phones of um, students at both the um, uh, K through 12, but also um, post-secondary that would give them immediate access to a licensed mental health professional. And it's set up to start a, a pilot project um, in the 2023-24 school year on uh, Jefferson County and two other counties. And then I think they are looking for some overall funding for that. Um, we have a maternal mental health bill. Um, there's a lot of uh, misinformation and misinformation about postpartum depression, which is what you typically hear about. But there's a whole range, and I can tell you as a mental health provider, there's a whole range of um, what we call perinatal mental health disorders. They're called mood and anxiety disorders. And the perinatal period is all through the pregnancy and actually a year post uh, birth so that we know sometimes that moms are not aware that what they're experiencing is not just exhaustion or tiredness, but may really be depression. Uh, affects one in five moms, also affects one in 10 dads. So really important for us to get a handle on this and to um, actually train more mental health professionals to treat perinatal um, mood and anxiety disorders. 
There's been a lot of talk about the regulation of cannabis and making medical cannabis uh, available, House Bill 22, 47, 48. Um, and the new one is Senate Bill 47 that may actually have some traction. So keep an eye on that. There is a lot of public support for certainly uh, making medical cannabis available. Uh, House Bill 125 would make sure that uh, information on Alzheimer's and dementia is made more available in every place that um, uh, consumers of health services can be. Uh, House Bill 150 would require uh, coverage, insurance coverage for genetic biomarker testing, which is the newest and greatest thing in cancer treatment. Um, House Bill 248 is an important piece of legislation for the for people that are addicted and need to and want to live in recovery housing. Um, this is typically uh, housing that uh, does not allow the use of any chemicals at, at all. But there has been a proliferation of these recovery housing units uh, without any regulation. And we feel like in some cases, the um, individuals that are there because they have no place else to go are being taken advantage of. So we're trying to get those not, not banned by any means, but regulated. Uh, an important piece also on the addiction side, and I think it's House Bill 353 that's moving, is to allow fentanyl test strips to be um, used and distributed. These would help people uh, test the substance that they are about ready to ingest into their system to see if it has fentanyl. And as you know, fentanyl is extremely dangerous and, and fatal. Um, those test strips have been classified as drug paraphernalia, uh, and we're trying to get them declassified and out to people. Um, an interesting bill over in the Senate that has some movement is to require substance use disorder centers uh, to provide transportation for their folks. They want their folks to get into regular um, treatment meetings and uh, to get a job and you know get to their various therapy appointments and so forth but people very often have uh, used all of their uh, money on drugs and have no way to get themselves there. And then a bill that probably will pass the house, it's on what they call the consent calendar, meaning they think it will have unanimous approval. In the house tomorrow is a bill to um, require many more notifications, regulations, and um, immunity for uh, workers who, rep who report problems in the workplace around safety. So there are some bills on what we call infrastructure. There's several that would um, have an all payers claims database, which we have been uh, advocating for at Kentucky Voices for Health for a number of years. Um, this would um, require all the public and private insurers to share their information and make that available to consumers, providers, uh, researchers, and so forth. Uh, there's two bills, Senate Bill 105 and House Bill 200, to create more scholarships for healthcare workforce. And I know in House Bill 200, not sure in 105, it includes um, all levels of healthcare and also includes mental health uh, workforce. House Bill 134 is kind of a technical but very important piece. One of the things the insurers like to do is to uh, require the providers to jump through a lot of hoops in order to get their services or their prescription uh, approved for payment. And we call that prior authorization. And this bill would, <clears throat> excuse me, exempt providers from this prior authorizations if they have a good track record of, you know, prescribing or recommending treatments that are acceptable. Um, House Bill 345 would plug a hole in Medicare. Actually, we don't typically deal with Medicare because that's a federal uh, insurance program, but this is um, a gap that has, cre has been created and we wanna get that plugged. House Bill 56 would make sure that everyone understands that each community mental health center, that's CMHC, has a designated um, region uh, where their services should be located. Senate Bill 29, Senator Meredith, and this is, I don't know, Emily, the third or fourth or fifth session that he's brought this. He wants to limit the number of uh, Medicaid managed care organizations to just three 
Right now we have six, and I think all providers would tell you that they're spending a lot of um, time and money and energy in dealing with uh, six different MCOs. Um, House Bill 148 uh, is for uh, substance use disorder and mental health service providers. And what happens is that if you are an out of network provider, what the insurer, at least one large insurer was doing, was sending the payment for the service directly to the policyholder and not to the provider of service. We've heard from some policyholders that they don't want to get the money. It's just a pain in the neck for them. And some of the providers are not getting what they should be paid uh, for providing the service. We've done a lot of work on benefits and on social determinants of health. And this just gives you a little bit of an idea. House Joint Re uh, Resolution 39 would address what we call the benefits cliff where people fall out of coverage because they make a few dollars over the um, limit. Um, House Bill 21 is a very important bill to make sure that um, the homeless, including uh, 16 and 17 year olds have access to a free photo ID. It's uh, used for a lot of purposes, including getting a job. And when you're homeless and don't have a stable address, it's really hard to be able to access that. Um, also, the um, Heart, a, a Heart project is uh, the housing um, emergency um, readiness fund. And although this is not a budget session, they're making a big push to get $150 million into that fund this session and another 150 uh, into the uh, funding next session. House Bill 384, we think would increase uh, access to healthy foods by creating a healthy farm and food board. And then there are several bills, House Bill 305 and 318 that deal with how, how, excuse me, child care assistance programs and making sure that families remain eligible. And when we did our road show, there were probably more questions around transportation and child care assistance than, than probably anything else. So now we turn to the dark side. If you'll go to the next slide, please, Kelly. These are bills that we're extremely concerned about and that we are opposing. And um, I've been going to Frankfurt for 40 plus years and I can tell you that I don't think, well, I, I'm sure that there has not been a session where we have seen so many bills that are anti-LGBTQ and anti-trans. And so I have several of them listed. The ones that are moving are House Bill 470, uh, which just passed the House on Thursday on pretty much a party line vote, although there were some brave Republicans, a couple of them who voted no on the bill. Um, it would ban literally all health care um, consultation, counseling, uh, information about anything that has to do with gender transition or gender affirming care. Um, it had a mental health component in it and that they took out, but I will tell you as a mental health professional that this bill, should it pass, will have extremely negative impacts on um, our trans uh, kids and their families. And I think and, uh, that we will see an uptick in um, suicide attempts and hopefully not, but probably successfully completed suicides by this very at-risk population. We think the trans population is 0.6 of 1%. So we're talking about a tiny, tiny group um, of kids and they have become the target for some reason by our legislators. Uh, Senate Bill 150 has passed the Senate and has not yet been taken up in the House. And it does damage also to the trans community, uh, goes after them in the schools um, so that the school teachers are literally prohibited from um, referring to a student by uh, his or her preferred name and pronouns, even if it's requested by that student's family. So this is supposed to be about uh, parental rights, but it really only goes one way. And again, I um, have talked to several school teachers. You all probably know some school teachers that um, are very upset about this and, and uh, feel like it's making the school not a safe place. The kids also have to be outed um, if they make that request. The parents have to be notified. 
And we had testimony on Thursday about parents um, who were so upset about their kids being either LGBTQ or, or trans that they are um, punishing them severely. Uh, Senate Bill 115 would ban drag shows, which on the face of it, you know, you're like, well, you know, that's not just a big deal. Actually, for um, people that uh, perform in these shows and the testimony was was heartrending. Um, you know, um, the person said, you're denying my reality, my existence, as well as the way that I work and, and earn an income. Uh, there have been um, Senate Bill 5 is the banning of books and other materials in schools. Um, and it's a little bit, you know, uh, what's in the eye of the beholder in terms of what is pornographic or what is inappropriate for kids. And then the bathroom bill, which has been around for several sessions, House Bill 30, um, would shut off the use of bathrooms by trans kids. And I think, Kara, that you had some information you wanted to share from a, a human rights perspective. Is Kara with us? Yes, I am with you. I um, okay. was just unmuting on the incorrect device. So, okay, thank you. I've got some alphabet soup to share that I'm like the letters we'd write down. Um, HHS, the Health and Human Services, OCR, which is the Health and Human Services Office for Civil Rights, and Section 1557. So those are the three big important things where I'm going to talk about. And of course, like Sheila said, or Dr. Shisha said, civil rights. Civil rights are your personal rights guarantees that are protected by the U.S. Constitution and federal laws. Civil rights include protection from unlawful discrimination. So that's why this comes up um, with relationship to how House Bill 70 passed the House last week and all of these other bills that Dr. Schuster just went over. OCR is the law enforcement agency within HHS that is responsible for guaranteeing that people are free from discrimination. And now that's all kinds of discrimination. So discrimination based on race, color, national origin, lang primary language, disability, age, religion, sex, including pregnancy, sexual orientation, gender identity, by basically any healthcare provider or human services that accepts any kind of federal money, which is to say, basically all of them um, because of Medicare and Medicaid. Now, their section 1557 of the ACA is very clear about explicitly prohibiting discrimination based on gender. That said, there's of course a lawsuit in Texas last fall that essentially like set aside um, the OCR's guidance um, that came out last March. So last March guidance came out and then in October 1st, the District Court for the Northern District of Texas issued a judgment vacating the guidance. HHS is currently evaluating next steps since ongoing litigation, but that doesn't change how extremely strong and clear the underlying law is, and it doesn't change that OCR is accepting complaints. So I'm here just to tell everyone um, that if you think you've been discriminated against in, in a health program or an activity that receives any kind of federal money, file a complaint. If you are a parent or caregiver who believes your child has been denied health care, including gender affirming care very specifically, or on the basis of your child's gender identity, file a complaint with OCR. They are still accepting complaints. Um, and if you are a healthcare provider who, or no one um, who believes that you or others have been unlawfully restricted from providing health care to a patient on the basis of that patient's gender identity, file a complaint. So those are our big three. A message is to say that the federal law is pretty clear on, on this point, that there's no doubt in my mind that everything that Kentucky is looking at right now is flies in the face of what the federal law does, which occupies this space, and there will be a litigation forever and ever more around this, but that you do have investigators who um, it is worth filing a complaint. I know that people are going to also still be scared for fear that you're just identifying yourself with the future administration, um, but they're that's been um, dealt with pretty square, pretty strongly to protect people's identities. So there've been a lot of protections in the years so far. This has been in existence since 2010. Um, and I, rec I, re I highly recommend that you spread the word, especially in Kentucky, even if you feel like your rights have been chilled based on what's already happened, even though House Bill 470 is not law, the language that was used last week was, was damaging. 
Um, and I'm sure that it, it chilled providers and or families um, just from the conversation that was said and just the language of the bill, even though it's not law yet. That's all. Thank you so much, Kara. And that gives people an avenue for pursuing this. I do, um, in fact, Representative Kim Moser in speaking against the bill in committee raised the issue of we're going to move the workforce, the healthcare workforce back 50 years. Uh, if this bill, if House Bill 470 passes, um, who would want to come to medical school here? Who would want to stay here and practice? Um, Dr. Chris Bowling, who's a 30-year practitioner of pediatrics, said it will be impossible to practice pediatric medicine in Kentucky if this passes. And that's what we were saying uh, when the mental health providers were still in there. And although we are not in there and not directly um, challenged by this, again, the impact on the mental health of the trans community and their families and uh, the entire LGBTQ community is, I think, um, was a sad day is all I can say last Thursday. Um, we're still dealing with uh, opposition to COVID vaccines. So there's two bills, House Bill 31 and, and 101 that would prohibit schools uh, from requiring student vaccinations for COVID. Uh, COVID. Uh, so they could not say you have to have a COVID vaccination in order to come to school. Uh, Senate Bill 65 is um, problematic because uh, the administration last summer announced that they were expanding Medicaid benefits for adults in the areas of hearing, vision, and dental services. And everybody was extremely um, joyful about that. Uh, it rolled out January 1st. And uh, Senate Bill 65 would essentially end it um, by um, disapproving the regulations. What we really want the legislature to do is to find some way to uh, keep these newly expanded Medicaid benefits. Everybody has agreed that um, if you have hearing, vision, or dental problems, uh, it's very difficult for you to seek work and to be um, a you know productive worker, and that's very much what the legislators want everyone to be. So let's give people what they need in terms of uh, health care, and those who are on Medicaid should get those benefits for hearing, vision, and dental. Uh, there's a couple bills. Fortunately, they are not uh, moving. House Bill 57 is an outright refusal for medical treatment. Um, you know, we don't like to use it often, but in mental health, we have KRS 202A, which allows the involuntary commitment of someone who is so mentally ill that they are a danger to self or others. And we really are concerned that that bill, if it were to move and pass, would make that mechanism that's really for the safety of the individual and those around him or her uh, moot. So we're glad that so far it's not moving. House Bill 58 has been um, in the General Assembly in previous years, usually on the Senate side, and it allows anyone in a health facility, literally anyone from the medical director to the janitor, to the clerk, to uh, anybody who works in it, to deny any health service on the basis of their conscience. It also would allow any payer on the basis of the payer's conscience and I'm not sure how we find out who's the conscience of Anthem or Humana uh, to deny health services. So this is just blatant uh, grounds for discrimination. And we also are concerned about juvenile justice. We're concerned about what's happened in the detention centers, uh, some of which the administration is trying to fix. There's talk about new funding to reopen the um, detention center and Louisville, and while we um, applaud keeping kids closer to home, we are very concerned about this bill. It would open the entire juvenile record and all parts of it uh, for five years for those who are found guilty of a um, violent offense, which could include even burglary. It allows detention for up to 48 hours before there's any evaluation of the child or any adjudication, and it does not fund sufficient mental health services. So those are the bills that are giving us heartburn and, and making us um, worry about what direction the legislature is gonna go next. Um, next slide, please, Kelly. 
So lots of ways to make your voice heard. And I'm not going to go through this because we've been there, done that. Uh, www.legislature.ky.gov. Uh, practice that that message line number, 800-372-7181. Have it on uh, quick call in your phone. Uh, there is a, a Spanish language line that's new this year. Uh, remember that you can call your legislator's offices and ask for a meeting with them and identify yourself as a constituent if you are. And you can also email them. Generally, it's first name, last name at lrc.ky.gov. And then if you can't be in Frankfurt, you can follow the action live on the, on the Kentucky Education Television Legislative link or the YouTube channel. And those are archives, so you can go back afterwards and hear all the pearls of wisdom that were either said or, or listened to or not listened to. Uh, next, please. And just a remember, uh, reminder that 2023 is an important election year. All statewide offices will be on the ballot in May. That's May 16th and November 7th. So governor, attorney, attorney general, secretary of state, auditor, treasurer and commissioner of agriculture. You can only vote in the primary um, with the party that you're registered for. So if you're registered as an independent, you cannot vote in the primary election. If you're registered as a Republican, you cannot vote on the Democratic candidates in the primary and vice versa. Uh, be sure you're registered, spread the word, uh, research the candidates, support the ones you choose with your feet, meaning help them, help them uh, with their door-to-door -door canvassing, uh, speak up. Uh, remember that elections are extremely costly. And so put your money where your mouth is and then be sure to vote. And just a reminder that uh, elections have consequences. So um, that's, that's my spiel for today. And I'm happy to um, listen for any questions. Oh, we do have an accessibility guide because um, the Rules change all the time and they don't make it easy for you to have your voice heard in Frankfurt. So be sure to uh, tune into that. And at this point, I will turn it over to my friend Dustin. Thank you very much. Well, I don't ever like to follow up with um, Sheila because she is a master at this, but I'm going to try. And I'm also going to go really quickly to try and get us um, catch up a little bit of time here. But uh, if you have questions, I'll be around to answer them in the chat. Again, my name is Dustin Pugel. I'm the policy director at the Kentucky Center for Economic Policy. Um, and one of the things that I track and work on is our workforce. Um, and so we're gonna give a few economic updates because uh, to the extent that all of these programs and policies are required, a lot of that's dependent on how well we're doing uh, as a state economically. So to start out, um, I don't know if folks heard the good news, but we have, recovered all of the jobs that we lost during COVID and then some. Um, this was, uh, this yellow line here on the chart kind of shows the COVID downturn as opposed to the other two most recent downturns. And it fell three times as far, but we recovered twice as quickly. Um, and that's by and large, thanks to a lot of federal spending in Kentucky with expanded unemployment benefits, direct checks, health care, child care expansions and, and so forth. Um, it's really incredible uh, that we've recovered this quickly. Now, that's not been true um, for everyone in the state. We know that um, men recovered more quickly than women. Um, Black Kentuckians still face uh, an employment rate that's double what white Kentuckians face. The public sector has yet to recover uh, fully, whereas the private sector has sort of gone gangbusters. But, um, but by and large, we're headed in the right direction as a whole. So let's go to the next slide. Um, I have way too many charts and tables on this slide, but I, I just couldn't help myself. So check them out whenever you want to when we send these out. The, the point here is that there are some folks who are still out of the labor force. Um, and even after adjusting uh, for inflation, we're pretty close to normal. The folks who haven't come back yet are folks who have retired, uh, folks who are still out caregiving, think either people caring for elderly parents or even more likely folks who can't find or afford childcare right now. Um, there's been less immigration in the last few years, so they have not contributed to our workforce as, as they have in the past. And then we also know that there have been a lot of people who have sadly passed away because of COVID, and that has showed up in our uh, labor force as a whole. So let's go to the next slide. 
I saw a um, press release from the governor today that showed that we have the low, or in 2022, we had the lowest unemployment rate uh, in basically since the 60s in Kentucky. And that's showing up in our unemployment insurance claims as well. So we are currently seeing about half of the number of folks who need uh, unemployment insurance than we did before the pandemic. That's a good sign. Uh, that means that folks are not being laid off as much and, and the labor market is still robust. Um, so it's important that we make sure that our unemployment insurance system is there for folks when they need it. Um, but it's also showing us that um, by and large, uh, our labor force remains pretty healthy. All right, let's go to the next slide. I wanted to say a couple of things about how uh, we as a state pay for all the things that we're gonna talk about today. Um, obviously, uh, our state revenue comes from a number of sources. The largest single source is our individual income tax. So this is the, the amount of money that we're all sort of calculating right now in tax season, to make sure we didn't pay too much or too little. Uh, this money that comes out of our paycheck on a regular basis, or if we're um, self-employed, you know, we pay quarterly. Uh, it's a little over six, it was a little over $6 billion last fiscal year. It's about 41%. Um, this chart's a little bit old, it's a, it's a year old, but it's about 41% of our total general fund dollars. It's also a really good uh, source of revenue because it grows with the economy. So, uh, you know, we know that spending changes a, a little bit, but it typically doesn't go up very quickly. Uh, whereas income is, is basically what people are earning. And we know that wealthy people's income is rising faster than everyone else, or at least it has over the last 10 years. So it, our individual income tax keeps up with the economy in, in a better sense than the rest of these. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Unfortunately, something that Dr. Schuster mentioned was um, House Bill 1. House Bill 1 is a follow-up from House Bill 8 last year that essentially provides for a series of uh, half percentage point cuts to our income tax. So we used to have what's called a graduated income tax, where the more you earned, the higher percent of your income was paid in income tax, and it topped out at around 6%. In 2018, we quote unquote flattened that out to where everyone paid 5%. And that we took a pretty good hit uh, in our income from, from doing that. What House Bill 8 says is that as long as you have a certain amount of money in our savings account, our rainy day fund, budget or reserve trust fund, however you want to say it, um, and as long as uh, revenue receipts are above a certain amount um, compared to what we're spending, and that's key, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute, uh, then the state can reduce it by half percentage point. So the first half percentage point was automatic. It started at the beginning of the year. And with House Bill 1 this year, it went down another half percent. So we're now at 4% across the board, whereas a few years ago, the top rate was, was two percentage points higher than that. Um, so they did pass a few uh, new sales taxes to try and offset a little bit of that. But uh, the punchline is basically that for every dollar in new sales taxes we're going to bring in, we're going to lose $12 in income taxes, which is a total of about $1.2 billion out of a $14 billion general fund. That's nothing to sneeze at. That's a lot of money. So let's, let's move to the next slide. And if House Bill 8 goes as intended, that hole is only going to get deeper. So as we go through the next 30 years, essentially, um, the amount of money that we could lose is, is really significant. Um, let's go to the next slide. To put it in perspective, just a one percentage point decrease in our individual income tax is more money than we spend on all of our public post-secondary education institutions. So think UK, U of L, Eastern, Western, our entire community college system. It's more than that. And it's uh, right around half of what we spend on Medicaid with general fund dollars. So like I was saying before, you know, there is a, the only way to reduce the income tax per House Bill 8 is if you have about 10 percentage points uh, or 10% more in revenue coming in than you're spending. So that creates a sort of a perverse incentive for the General Assembly not to spend more on things like disaster housing or waiver slots or public sector compensation or any of the other things that we know we, we really need because it means that that would prevent them from being able to continue to lower the income tax, which they've already said is a goal. They want to go to 0%. Uh, so it's, it's a really 
frustrating, I think, scenario for a lot of advocates who know the need that exists in the state and know the uh, incentive that the General Assembly is going to have not to fill that need. So let's go to the next slide. I also want to point out that the folks benefiting the most from this are the wealthy. So if you're in the top 1% of earners in Kentucky, you earn on average $1.4 million a year, and you're going to get an $11,000 tax cut per percentage point decrease. If you are in the bottom 20% of earners, you're going to see almost no change. In fact, uh, the, because of our um, essentially a state version of a standard deduction in income tax, the people who live below the poverty line don't pay any income tax. So they're not going to see any benefit from this. What they are going to see is potentially budget cuts in the future or extra constraints on state spending on the programs that they rely on to get by. Um, so it's really concerning. Uh, and we'll go on to the next slide. Just a um, if folks remember, uh, Governor Sam Brownback in Kansas tried something like this uh, several years ago, and it was a catastrophe. They, their work, public workforce shrunk dramatically, and so public services suffered. Their um, schools went to four-day weeks. Uh, it was a really big problem. And, and what happened is the voters saw that. They voted out a lot of the folks who were supporting this. Um, they still had a Republican majority in their legislature, but they had to turn around and raise taxes again, which no legislator likes to do because essentially they could no longer um, fund a functioning state government. So if we keep headed down this road, um, then I'm afraid that we'll head down the same road Kansas did and we're going to have to do the same things that Kansas did at, at that point. So with that cheery note, I'm going to hand it on over to Adrian to talk about uh, housing and um, what we're trying to do for folks in Eastern and Western Kentucky. Thanks, Dustin. All right, good to be with you all this afternoon. I wanna talk briefly about emergency rental assistance winding down because I know this has been top of mind for many of folks across the Commonwealth. So over the winter, the Healthy at Home Eviction Relief Fund, um, which has been funded mostly through the American Rescue Plan Act, um, publicly closed to new applicants. So we're going to talk about what remains. In Louisville, we ask folks who um, need assistance to visit stopmyeviction.org. There are a couple of key pieces here, um, including the housing stabilization program, um, and there are both links and more information on stopmyeviction.org about that program. Um, in February, the Louisville Urban League began um, rolling out an emergency deposit assistance program, including security deposit and one month's rent. Next slide. Okay, so in Lexington, um, you have a program that is more similar to what um, the housing stabilization program looked like over the past couple of years. Um, but basically effective February 1st, so a little over a month now, um, programs, uh, uh, program eligibility guidelines have changed um, basically to really triage folks who are, who have an active eviction case in Fayette District Court. Um, you, if you qualify for assistance, you can get up to 12 months of past due rent, up to three months of future rent and or payment of a security deposit and up to three months future rent if you have to relocate. Um, one big difference here is that it no longer covers rent and utilities for renters. So um, as folks have asked, you will get a copy of the slide deck and the links are live. So I have linked to um, more information on this page, on this, on this slide in particular. Okay. So if you may be wondering if the Healthy at Home Eviction Relief Fund closed to, public, to the public, then what happens, and we have programming in Lexington and Louisville, then what happens in the one, other 118 counties? Um, so the bottom line is we're trying to figure all of this out. Um, we have always, since the pandemic, have maintained a contact sheet of known homeless service providers by county and area development districts. Some of these folks um, 
may have been providing rapid rehousing or other types of homeless assistance under the CARES Act, they may be transitioning to um, emergency rental assistance for people at risk of homelessness, people experiencing homelessness, that sort of thing. So we are updating our contacts. Um, and so for example, we've included um, what we know about in Moorhead and Round County, um, those, those resources will be updated as well. Next slide. The housing assistance fund for people with mortgages continues. Um, there appears to be plenty of money in that fund um, and no risk of reallocation. So next slide. Um, these are the program guidelines, um, including up to $35,000 in assistance around mortgages, utilities, insurance, property taxes, and homeowners association fees. So the funds will be available until fully expended or September 30th, 2025, whichever comes first. Next slide. Okay, so we, as we've been discussing, we're in the middle of the legislative session. So these are some of the things that we have an eye, our eye on. One is um, disaster housing bills. There are a couple of different vehicles um, that the legislature could make a significant impact in disaster housing and both responding to um, the past disasters from 2021 and 22 and potentially setting up for a response moving forward. Um, this storm over the weekend, <laughs> It's just, I was like, this is a little bit too on the nose, right? Um, so we've got SB 196 and SB 197. Those are both bills filed by Senate President Robert Stivers from Manchester, Clay County. One touches the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. The other touches the safe funds that were established by the General Assembly um, in, in the regular session and the special session in 2022. There is a third bill that is SB 286 filed by Senator Brandon Smith, who had been a real champion of housing and the response needed um, in the special session back in August. So he is also working on some uh, proposal. And then on the House side, we have Representative John Blanton, who chairs the House Transportation Committee, but also has been listening to housing providers in Eastern Kentucky and has also filed a bill. Now, to be clear, these are all shell bills, which means that the language is still being worked out behind the scenes. As Sheila talked about at the beginning, this is kind of a frustrating, tense time um, it, for advocates because some of this work is happen happening externally, some of it's happening internally, um, but, the bottom line is we feel confident that something related to disaster housing will happen this session. Um, and that has to happen pretty quickly because we're now in March. So, all right. Um, yeah, it, just to touch on Kelly's comment, a shell bill is, um, well, I kind of view it like currency. It is not inherently bad. It can be used for good or evil. Um, and there you go. House Bill 21, IDs for people experiencing homelessness, has passed the House 94-0, and it's awaiting a Senate committee assignment. We expect it will be um, sent to Senate transportation, hopefully tomorrow. Eviction expungement, we've got a couple of bills that we are discussing. One is SB 134, filed by Senator Rocky Adams from Louisville, and one from um, Representative Kolkarni, also from Louisville, which is House Bill 342. Um, so we are excited. This is a fairly new idea for the General Assembly to consider. We're glad that there are bills in both the House and the Senate um, that can really work on making that clean slate after a period of time um, for people who rent, people who are experiencing homelessness, who people who have had evictions on their records. Um, this is a housing stability measure that we are very, very excited about. So stay tuned. And then lastly, we maintain a bill tracker 
um, that looks at all of the bills that are filed in the General Assembly um, with an eye towards housing, and more particularly, how does it affect um, people who are housing insecure in Kentucky? So if you are ever interested in what we are looking at, advocating for, um, that sort of thing, just click that link once you get the slide deck. Next slide. And I am so quick. It is now time for Tyler to talk about SNAP and PEBT. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, hey, y'all, Tyler Offerman from the Kentucky Bill Justice Center. I am also going to try and move through my slides a little quickly. I am happy to report there is no large, terrible bill undermining food and feeding programs this year. I will assume everyone is cheering loudly. So I'll mostly just being some doing some updates on the programs. So real quick, these are just some of the main feeding programs that were across Kentucky. I won't go over the details, but they're here for you to see them. Next slide. And just wanna make sure to make the point that the programs in green are not impacted by a client's citizenship status. So that can be helpful when helping folks enroll in these programs. Next slide. I've said this a lot, it's not something that uh, Many of us probably don't know, but a lot of folks in Kentucky face hunger, food insecurity, and not knowing where they'll be able to get their next meal. These numbers are from a couple of years ago, before the you know much of the pandemic happened. So it's speculated that uh, it's probably closer to seven hundred thousand Kentuckians are facing food insecurity, and one in six of those are kids. So it's a big problem for us. Next slide. Just to follow the trends a little bit, you can see the Great Recession starting back in 2008, 2009. Peak of that, we had almost 880,000 Kentuckians on SNAP in July of 2023, came down and then pandemic hits, skyrockets. It started to level off a little bit. The trend line is increasing. It seems like every month of data, there's a, a few more thousand Kentuckians that are added to the SNAP rolls, which means that, um, you know, like Dustin pointed out, there's a lot of communities that the economic recovery post-pandemic has been very uneven, and we see that in our SNAP data. Next slide. Just to give you a sense across the state, um, these numbers, not surprisingly, pretty much match uh, poverty metrics across the state. So a lot of folks are on SNAP because there's a lot of uh, poverty and food insecurity in the counties that are dark blue. Got some of the overarching numbers on the side here as far as spending SNAP in Kentucky. Not gonna go down the wormhole of economic impact of SNAP, but it is massive. Uh, and just last month, we had close to $100 million come into Kentucky to fund local grocers and farmers. So not only does it help address food insecurity, it brings a lot of money into Kentucky. Next slide. Um, so this is uh, just here for folks that are helping people enroll in SNAP or navigate this process. During the pandemic, uh, this wasn't necessary. These deductions, because a lot of folks were getting the maximum amount since the emergency allotments have ended, this is really important to help folks look at, are they maximizing all their deductions? For each deduction that they file, their benefits will go up. So, and this is especially important again, because folks have been sort of out of practice doing this during the pandemic, but next slide. All right, so we mentioned the end of the emergency allotments. Another new development is that the federal government, Health and Human Services, has indicated that the federal public health emergency will be ending. We've already talked about this in some of these presentations, and many of you all know this. Uh, but with that, so comes back a work requirement in SNAP. Some folks might know it as the ABOD work requirement or the time limit, but it is specifically for um, single uh, non-elderly, non-disabled folks. So, you know, you don't have a kid, you're not disabled, 
and you're between 18 and 49. So this work requirement, uh, you have to meet it. If you don't meet it, you lose your benefits. You basically get three strikes. If you do not make the requirement three months out of three years, uh, then you lose SNAP benefits. So I know Thrive, we've been talking about maybe doing a more robust training for direct service practitioners about this specific thing, because it is complicated and it was designed to be complicated. The amount of folks that are subject to this can be uh, small, comparably, comparably to the number of folks on SNAP, but it can be fusing and it can trip a lot of people up. Uh, and you know, there's a reporting requirement to it, which can just be very burdensome on folks struggling uh, with everyday life, especially folks struggling in poverty. So with that being said, the work requirements go back into effect in June. So folks should be receiving notices around May or June. Um, I mentioned that three month time limit. So effectively starting July 1st is when the state will start saying, you did not meet your obligations under this work requirement. And the first disenrollments would therefore start in October. So I do not like this policy. I think it needs to be removed from SNAP altogether, but it has not. And I have yet to be able to convince Congress to do that. So if you have questions, we have been told the cabinet will be putting up uh, some information on the website as far as how folks can sign up for employment and training or how they can meet this qualification. But Thrive will certainly be sending out lots of information and fielding questions from any and all of you about it. Uh, so next slide and last part on the work requirements. There are counties that are waived. So within the SNAP program, it basically says if unemployment is above a certain level, then the state can apply for a waiver for that county. So these are the counties that are not subject to the work requirement. So until November 30th, if you are in one of these counties or if you're helping folks enroll in this county, they don't need to worry about it. If you do not see your county on this list, then that means the work requirement will be starting up uh, in your communities soon. So if you have any questions about that, please reach out to me or other folks. Uh, Again, this can be hard to help folks navigate, and we want to make sure that before they start, people have all the information they need. So next slide. All right, so RBT, um, I think we've talked about this before. It was made permanent. Folks are trying to get this permanent for literally decades. Um, so we will have a permanent summer EBT program to replace food for kids when they would normally re be receiving it at school. Um, not too much of an update here besides to remind folks that it exists um, and we'll definitely communicate out more once we know when this summer's PBT benefits will be going out. Next slide. And with that being said, um, many of us are familiar with pandemic EBT, PBT, with the end of the federal public health emergency, so ends this program. So this year will be the last year that any PEBT benefits go out, but there will be at least one last round of payments. Um, we do not have the final details on that yet. The state sent a plan to the feds, the feds are sending feedback to the state, but we do know that it will have to be sent out before September 30th, 2023, because that's the date that the omnibus bill that I mentioned earlier said. So hopefully we know before then, uh, and we'll share that information with you. Next and possibly final slide. So there has been a huge problem across the country in recent months where folks are getting their benefits stolen off of their EBT card because uh, effectively fraudsters are setting up these fake machines that steal people's benefits without their knowledge. It is a problem in Kentucky. We've gotten reports of it, not nearly as bad as some other states. But if you will, one, work with clients with an EBT card, make sure to warn them about this and how they can protect themselves. That being said, often there's not a whole lot they can do. So in that omnibus bill I mentioned, Congress did basically allow states to reimburse a certain amount of benefits that are stolen. 
it's a temporary fix and it's an imperfect fix. But the biggest advice while the state finalizes the details on when they'll start sending out refunds is just record everything, right? If this happened to you, write it down, call it, report it. Um, because they, you know, you will need to get in line to be able to get these benefits returned to you by identifying yourself to the state. So I will also say here, if this has happened to you, uh, I recommend contacting your local legal services program um, for help because it can be, a, yeah, alarming uh, to say the least if you find out this happened to you. So, all right, I try to go quick and I think that's it. Thanks, Tyler. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Priscilla Easterling, the Outreach Coordinator for Kentucky Voices for Health, and today I'm covering the PHE Unwinding and Medicaid Renewals. Uh, so a couple of just uh, big updates. Um, if you take nothing else from this section, please know these things. Uh, so federally, as we've all talked about, the public health emergency is ending May 11th. Um, in the last couple of years, we've talked about the public health emergency being connected to, the, to this maintenance of effort provision, uh, which essentially means that over the last several years, three years since March 2020, um, no one who has been enrolled or who has enrolled in Medicaid uh, has been disenrolled. So unless you have moved out of state, passed away, or specifically contacted DMS and asked them to uh, disenroll you from your coverage, no one has lost their coverage. Um, but now all of that is changing. The omnibus bill passed back in December, set a, uh, set a date, it, one, de-linked the maintenance of effort provision from the public health emergency, and then set a date for Medicaid renewals to begin. So for Kentucky, beginning April 1st, next month, uh, less than a month away now, Medicaid renewals are starting again. Um, and while they are starting April 1, no one should lose their coverage before May 31st. Uh, if you do, that there's a problem, please contact me and let me know. Um, but no one should lose their coverage before May 31st. Um, beginning in April, though, all members, are all Medicaid enrollees will receive some notice from the state. It'll be either a notice saying, hey, uh, we have enough information on file, you're good, your coverage will be extended through X day, um, or it'll be saying, hey, we need a little bit more information, um, can you submit this specific piece of information, which is a request for information and RFI, or it'll be a full Medicaid renewal packet saying, hey, we don't have enough information on file or based on the information we do have, we don't think you're eligible, so please fill out this full renewal packet and then they'll uh, determine your eligibility based on that. Um, Medicaid renewals will be spread out over 12 months. So not everyone is gonna receive a notice April 1 or the beginning of April, um, but over the next 12 months, all members will receive a notice. So it's super important that contact information is updated in your Connect account. Um, if you don't know how to do that, feel free to reach out to connectors. They can help you do that. You can call DMS um, and they can help you do that as well. Um, and MCOs will also be sending out letters to members to let them know of their upcoming renewal, uh, of their upcoming renewal. Um, the Medicaid renewal dates will be available in the system as of March 20th. We just got that confirmation last week. And so if you want to just be proactive and check your date, you can call, you can log into the Connect self-service self portal yourself. You can call the Connect hotline and check. You can meet with a connector, or you can also ask your provider at your doctor's appointment, doctor's office, and ask them to check the KY Health Net uh, provider portal. Um, these are like the most important things to know is to make sure that contact information is up to date, because if it's not, you could possibly miss a notice and possibly lose, end up losing your coverage for not responding. Um, there are some great unwinding resources available. The state has a, a unwinding page at that link, medicaidunwinding.ky.gov. There are also now, as of Friday, Spanish translations, of, uh, Spanish uh, translated materials on, uh, on the website. They're also working on other languages uh, so that we can make sure that we're getting the word out to everyone and culturally appropriate and easily understandable uh, uh, materials. Um, our partners at KY Policy, Dustin, uh, put out a great explainer that really walks through the entire background of Medicaid, of the Medicaid unwinding, um, 
as well as some really great charts. We love charts here. Um, and really walks through the whole, uh, what you need to know about unwinding. Um, TVH, we also put together a great one pager about, uh, about the unwinding. And so it's a really good resource to be able to use and hand out to clients who might be affected or who need more information. So those are all linked there. Next slide, please. I'm gonna sort of run through these next several slides pretty quickly. Um, these are, a, a lot of this is just background information. If you want to know more, here's more information, but you don't need to know this. The highlight here is that the PHE is ending May 11th. Um, that's gonna come with other, um, other uh, PHE flexibilities that, that are gonna be ending at that time, um, but the PHE is ending. Um, period. Next slide, please. Um, and it's really important because here's another great chart that Dustin put together. Uh, 400,000 more Kentuckians have been covered under Medicaid since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, it just really goes to show how critical Medicaid has been during the pandemic to protecting Kentuckians and keeping folks connected to healthcare and um, yeah, that's, it's been incredible. And so the stakes are really high as the unwinding starts because we don't want folks to lose their coverage unnecessarily or because of administrative reasons. And so it's important that that contact information is up to date and that everyone is aware of what's happening because the stakes are high, you could lose your coverage and we don't wanna scare folks, but we need to make sure that everyone's aware of what's going on. Next slide. Also next slide. Uh, that last slide was just saying that the um, omnibus bill delinked the uh, delinked the maintenance of effort from the public health emergency. So I've already covered that. This is a high level uh, timeline of the renewals that uh, Deputy uh, Deputy Commissioner Veronica uh, Judy Cecil gave us last month. So last month they put out the renewal uh, plan redistrib redistribution plan and uh, system test. Um, beginning April 1, again, they're going to start sending out notices to folks. Um, they'll be coming to the they'll be coming to the address and that is on file. So please again update that information. Uh, one of the really great things about the way that the unwinding is being is being done is that there that um, D D DMS is required to report data monthly to CMS, the Center for Medicaid or uh, Medicaid and Medicare Services, and so that they can monitor what's going on. Um, Deputy Commissioner promised, uh, committed to sharing that data, those data reports as well. They'll be available on the unwinding page that I linked earlier. Um, and that'll also just be good information for everyone to keep track if you wanna know what's going on, who's being, who's being disenrolled, uh, what Kentucky stats look like. Um, so those will be available there. Um, and then May, May 31st will be the first day um, that Medicaid renewals are due and the first people will be disenrolled at the end of May. So June 1 will be the first day that anyone that had Medicaid in the last three years could possibly be without it. Next slide, please. Okay, and then for the prioritization that they're working with. Um, so in May 20, uh, so May, the first people who are being prioritized uh, to have their uh, eligibility rerun are gonna be the 14,000 people who were determined ineligible right as the maintenance of effort went into place in March, 2020. Um, they'll likely be disenrolled, but again, they'll receive a notice and the opportunity to submit more information if they're still eligible or eligible again. Um, for May through October, they're gonna prioritize the Medicare um, older or disabled Medicare eligible members um, who, have, who can stay insured simply by moving over to Medicare um, for around, they estimate that to be around 16,000 folks and around 14,000 of them are already enrolled in Medicare. Um, they will automatically rerun folks for uh, Medicaid savings program to see if the, anyone's dual eligible as well, um, but those will be the next priority. And then everyone else will be prioritized July moving forward. Anyone who's eligible for a QHP, which is a marketplace plan, um, they'll, their um, renewal we, will be prioritized later than everyone else to align with some of the other provisions that they're trying to put into place to connect folks with other options, their, uh, with other uh, system changes as well. 
Um, so there will be a couple of updates as we get closer to that. So next slide. Okay, our current Medicaid population is around 1.7 million. We're looking at around 243,000 folks who are estimated to lo lose eligibility. Um, they do already estimate that around 76,000 of those folks are eligible for QHPs. Um, and like I said, 16,000 that are eligible for Medicare as well. Everyone else, they, it, it's gonna really depend on what information uh, is submitted at that time. So it's really, really critically important that you check for those notices and send in your information uh, so that DMS can have an accurate, uh, accurate account of your current um, situation and can make an accurate determination. Next slide. Here is just a better breakdown of the data that we're looking at who we think are uh, who were um, who will be affected? I just want to highlight the sort of special populations: uh, postpartum, postpartum mothers, 4,500, um, around 15,000 Kentuckians over 64 years old, 14, 1,485 who are receiving community-based long-term care, and 810 Kentuckians in a nursing home, nursing facility. So. Um, that's a number of breakdown. They will have more snapshots. And again, this information will be available on their unwinding website. Next slide. And this is also a great map that Dustin was in the chat and <laughs> just talking up. Um, this is the distribution across the state. You can look at uh, who is going to, who, where the folks are that are going to actually need to take action. We see that a lot of that is more concentrated in the Western part of the state, which I think is pretty interesting. Um, but again, this is just a, a better way to view this information. So, next slide. Okay. Um, and just a couple, I will wrap up, um, a couple of things. So open enrollment is over. Um, Medicaid and Medicaid and KCHIP are always open. So if you still need Medicaid, if you're currently uninsured, if you know anyone who's currently uninsured, you can still apply for Medicaid right now, today, any day throughout the year. Um, that is, that's still open. The marketplace is, uh, does have an open enrollment period that runs November 1st through January 15th. But the upside is that if you lose coverage, if you um, if you are one of these people, if you're one of the folks who are going to be affected by losing Medicaid, losing Medicaid is a special enrollment period. Next slide, please. Um, Yes, uh, so losing your Medicaid coverage, KCHIP, that's a special enrollment period that'll allow you to get enrolled in a, in a QHP plan. Uh, if you have job-based coverage that you lose, you can also um, get enrolled in a QHP plan as well. Any general life changes, the big things, getting married, having babies, all of those things are special enrollment periods. So again, if you know anyone who's uninsured, and needs coverage or loses the coverage that they had, they lose their Medicaid, they can always get back into a QHP plan through a special enrollment period. Um, but a quick note that failure to pay premiums does not qualify as a special, a, a special enrollment period. So if you had a marketplace plan and you didn't pay the premiums, that's not a special enrollment period. But if you're on Medicaid, you're one of the folks who are being disenrolled, in, a, in the next couple of months, that would be a special enrollment period. Next slide. Also want to highlight the ex exceptional special enrollment periods. Um, this is if any broad category, any like special individuals, special circumstances, uh, natural, natural disasters, abuse, violence, spousal abandonment, those can also qualify for an ex exceptional special enrollment period. And the next slide shows you how to apply for that. Um, which is sending an email to a direct, um, next slide please, uh, to, yes, by email or by mail. Um, so if you have specific problems that, you know, technical issues or anything else that's not the typical life changes, you can always reach out to a connector. They can help you apply through this or you can also apply this way. Next slide. There's also still a low income SCP available. So if you're, uh, if you know anyone or if you have income at or below 150% of the federal poverty line, you can enroll any month throughout the year without having to experience a qualifying life event. So that's also just a good piece of information to hold on to. Next slide. 
And then Medicare updates beginning January 1, free vaccines, the insulin cap uh, now at $35 and rebates for uh, drug manufacturers increasing prices faster than inflation. Um, the site again, please, for ESE. Um, so that the to send an ESE that goes directly to an email, um, and we'll it's included in the slides. I will put that in the chat here in just a second for you, Angela. Next slide. Perfect. Um, and last thing before I turn it over to Marcy, there are stakeholder meetings this month about unwinding, um, and we will include those in the follow up email and in the slides as well. So I will stop now, turn it over to Marcy. Thank you. Thanks, all. You know, they put behavioral health this, at this point strategically, right? It's been a long Zoom already, lots of information flying around. Um, I am with Mental Health America of Kentucky. Legislative highlights, I'm gonna probably skip most of this. Um, you all heard earlier from Sheila, a lot of highlights about mental health. Um, one note I'm not sure that came through strong enough though, um, any gambling bills that go through, we wanna make sure we add money for uh, problem gambling. I think that's the only thing that might have been just because of time uh, cut out of her area. So otherwise we are very concerned and share concerns about all kinds of um, really just all those anti-LGBT bills, um, overwhelming things. Also the mule bill that's out there just has mental health in it. We have no idea what's gonna happen, right? So um, it's been an interesting legislative session already. It's gonna continue to be, gonna hear a lot about mental health from a lot of different perspectives. Uh, if you are looking for our opinions, please follow us on social media. That's gonna be the best way to keep up with us. Um, also email, uh, join our email. Go ahead and do the next slide, uh, Kelly. So um, I wanted to briefly just kind of debrief us all a little bit um, and make sure that we're remembering to take care of ourselves in the next week and next month. Uh, lots of things are gonna be happening that may be beyond our per personal control, right? So remembering what we can control and doing what we can is really important. Um, you know, do get involved, right? Do email, do call, do protest and things like that. If that's up your alley and the things that you're able to do, but please don't internalize bad policy. <laughs> don't make it something that you have done to yourself, right? That some failure of your part, you know, you don't have a magic wand. You can't beat all of them into submission, right? On um, whatever your issues might be. Um, so make sure that you're just kind of paying attention um, and that you recognize that it's not your fault right? If bad policy happens, make sure you, <laughs> thanks, Dustin. He's like that exact thing, right? We can do the best we can make the phone call, send the email, do the meetings with your legislators, right? Do the voting, do the, the things you can do on the ground, but remember that you are not responsible for things that are happening that may be negative, but you are also not alone. And I want you to make sure you're finding community wherever that might be, whether that's on an online process whether that's at your favorite coffee shop, in my case, one of those things, um, if there's a group of people that you can lean on to just kind of vent about these things, do that, but also make sure that you're not only going to each other to vent, that you're also propping each other up and giving each other space to breathe and reminders to breathe. Um, another thing is to check on your personal body. If this is all harming you in some physical way, it's time to step away for a minute, right? I had to do that on Thursday. I couldn't physically be in the Capitol. I wasn't well enough. And knowing that that's important about you, um, needing to know that. And I know lots of us need to hear it. Thanks, Mona. I, I hear it a lot, actually. So um, just a good reminder, right? That breathing technique, you know, that I do all the time. I always do triangle breathing or square breathing. If you don't know what those are, look those up. They can be used in the middle of the protest. Right? They can be used in the middle of hearings. I do it all the time. You'll hear me sometimes with the intake being a little harder than others, but it's really important, right? And to remember that and to drink that water, make sure you're taking your meds on time right? Still take care of you. Do what you can to expect the stress. Like this next week, you know, my schedule is not as busy as it would be otherwise, right? There's a lot of room and buffer zone for processing things that are happening. And I think if you are someone who needs to do that, you need to make sure you have that room. And also disengage. You can't be addicted to the news 24-7. It's not healthy for any of us, even those of us who work in this space. So try to make sure that you have good boundaries on your time and your connection. Know that it is okay to take a break. It is okay to take a breath, right? We are a choir. I can't remember who said that a long time ago, but it was true. We are a choir, right? Many people, many different voices. All of us have a moment to take a breath. So that's a really important thing with all these things. And then make sure you know that 988 exists. It's there for you 24-7. If you really are feeling overwhelmed and don't know what to do, 
they are a great resource for you. They, you do not have to be in crisis and you don't, do not have to be the person in crisis in order to reach 988. Go ahead and do the next slide. <laughs> I think that's important. Fun 988 Kentucky is very much alive. We are gonna be reviving here after the session. So um, we are holding off. There are a couple of great 988 bills out there right now. Um, they're probably not gonna move, um, but we will be working on making sure we fund this 24 seven resource for us here in Kentucky, You know, funded by Kentuckians for Kentuckians with that assistance of the backup from the federal. Go ahead and go to the next slide, Kelly. I'll be quick today. Mental health screenings are there. If you're not sure if what you're going through is normal or not, whether or not you're severe enough to need to be seen. I know some of us who are helpers and givers forget to take care of ourselves and are, are really bad gauges of whether it's time for us to get help. Uh, a screening can be helpful. They're online at mhascreening.org. Over 28,000 screenings were done in Kentucky last year. So you are not alone and people are finding value from these. You can email yourself those screenings. There's also that postpartum depression one. We talked about that a little bit earlier with some of the maternal mental health bills. That is a new addition here. So please check it out. These are all clinical tools that are valid. Go ahead and do the next slide, Kelly. And then, yeah, if you don't like 988, that's okay. Crisis text line is available to you, 741741. You can also text 988. You're getting those crisis text line folks here from Kentucky and our um, Penny Royal Center actually answers some of those calls. And then the Trevor Project. If you're LGBTQ, I cannot stress enough. The Trevor Project is a fantastic resource. They have a fantastic way of getting out of their website in a second. You hit the escape button, everything goes and your browser clears. So if someone is in an unsafe situation, they can quickly get out, but still get access to help. I think that's a really important thing to highlight. They also have phone chat, other things. They have groups that you can join online. So some wonderful places that are safe and browser friendly um, so that they are not tra as traceable. All right, and we always have our website as well. And on to Emily. Awesome. Thank you, Marcy, and everyone for your fantastic updates. I'm just gonna wrap us up very quickly here. If you can just advance to the next slide. Wanted to make sure that you again saw the accessibility guide. Here is an image of the front um, and a link that you'll get tomorrow. And most importantly, dates for our 2023 webinar schedule. So you have these here, these are live links. They'll be um, available too in the follow-up email. So make sure to be registering um, and getting these on your calendar. And then um, most importantly, our roadshow schedule. So once we wrap up this legislative session, we're gonna hit the road again. April 18th is our first, um, and we will be going to Bowling Green, Covington, Hazard, Lexington, Louisville, Moorhead, Owensboro, and Paducah this year. So eight locations. Um, we will have registration links out very, very soon, um, but for now, save the date. And there is a, a website that you can go to a web page with information, and we'll have um, the registration for April 18th to you, um, if not tomorrow, by the end of the week. And finally, our Advocacy 101 training, actually not finally, um, but the most recent Advocacy 101 um, was in January. If you missed it, you can watch the recording, and the link is right here. Always a good reminder if you um, need those skills and tips. And uh, let's skip this one, Kelly, for this um, particular one. Uh, so I also wanted to just point out again the fantastic analysis that KY Policy did of the Medicaid unwinding and, and the renewals that need to take place um, over the next year. And then our explainer that you can share with your community and with clients and so on so that people understand what's happening, when things are happening, and what they can do. So with that, I'm gonna wrap up. There are more resources here, but we um, will just leave those to you to peruse if you need them. And uh, you'll be getting an email tomorrow with the recording, with the slide deck, with these other materials. And we hope that you'll stay in touch with us. So thank you for your time today. Have a great afternoon and we'll see you next month. Bye everyone. <laughs>